Oh, this looks serious. I was just try trying to figure out. Uh... I alleged that I'm in talk mode, so I better not go to the bathroom. Oh. Hello. Perks, the warmest jacket on earth. Oh, I see. What the frack? What are we doing? So, are the speakers live? Hello, hello. All right. Can you hear me? Oh, I'm, you. I'm can hoping you? Jack can hear me. I can hear you fine. I hope that he can say something and we can hear him. Yeah, I I'm talking. Yeah. We're hearing you. Oh, good, good, good. This is like totally awesome. This is funny, yeah. So let's <laughs> see here. So I'm trying to remember how I do a screen share. There's some gadget here. I've done this already, and now I've forgotten how to do it. Yes. <laughs> screen share it. I've got it. This was scheduled too far in advance of the actual event. Let's see here. Oh, no, I have to bring something up on my screen first here. Now I go back to you. Now I do screen share. Now I do this, and now I do F. Let's see, I want to be in it. And now I do F5. Do you have a full screen view of my slide? We have a full screen view of you right now, but that may change shortly. Oh, I see. Well, then I'm not sharing my screen. Or is it just taking a long time to feed? Um, Say now. Well, it, yes. It, your voice will tell us the time delay. And we still don't see a screen. But you see me, huh? We okay, see you. I want to go to screen share. Okay, let me let me make this thing large and do F5 and see if Alt Tab works. I want to go to this Google Hangout. I want to do screen share. Hello. Hello. Screen share. Okay, I'm going to try to do this now. Awesome. Um, starts, oh, start screen share. Is it, what do you yeah, have on your screen, screen now? It's screen -rific. Yes, we see your screen. It, and it's black in the background, and it's not just the tool that I, the, the, the development tool? There are six, uh, panes. Oh, there's six panes. Instead. I, I try to get you to one. You have to select one of those. Yes, I'm trying to select one. It's kind of a pain with all those pains. Well, I've got two tools trying to teach me to select it. Okay, what do you have now? We have a screen with six panes. Screen with six panes, okay. Well, let me go out of screen share mode here. Stop screen share. Oh, oh, let's see. How do I select the screen? This is what... I see. That's not, that's not the screen I want. How do I pick a different screen? Um, eh, screen share. Okay. We have a picture of Jack. Okay, how about now? Now it's black with one pane. It says, Jack's cheap... Approximation of insight into UCSB QC. Oh, wonderful! That's what I've been trying to get to. Okay. Okay. Well, can here. You, uh, can you go full screen with the slide? Not have the uh, navigation bar on the left and no. the properties on the right. No. Oh, is that what it's showing now? Okay, that's that's what, uh, that's, now. that's what I've tried. That's what I've tried to do. Okay. Okay. Uh, you still got the thing? How about? Well, uh, it still has the uh, 
navigation screen version of. Yeah, well, here's, I see what you mean. How in this Google Hangout do I tell it, you've got the wrong screen, share a different screen? We don't know. I don't know either. Okay, well, I've got to stop screen sharing. Okay. I've got to go to screen share. Okay. Open office impression. Yeah. The okay. advice is to share your desktop and put the point up on the screen. Well, the point is it only go. It has its, its own little full screen mode, is what it is. Yeah. The, the tool okay. has its own little full screen mode, and it's not PowerPoint. It's Open Office. Okay, um, that's and, maybe. And, you know, and on and onwards we go. So, I would like to screen share one of them, but it doesn't show the full screen one I want. What does it show if I do this? It's showing a picture of the other picture. I see. Okay. That's ridiculous. I can't get it to do... I can't get it to do the full screen version of this. Now you're seeing my development tool, right? This is Open Office, right? Yeah. That, yeah. There's Open Office. That looks good. Let's go with that. Okay. Yeah, I give up. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, I just wanted to show you. I visited LA a couple weeks, you know, a couple weeks back, and I saw the uh, the orange aloe. Have you ever seen an orange aloe in Los Angeles? We have not. There it is, an indigenous perennial, and it's a source, seasonal source of healthy food for the inhabitants, many of whom are out of work movie technicians, musicians, and extras. A actually, there was an orange tree in the background, and some wit had stuck an orange on every spike of an aloe. So I, yes. I thought I would see you, show you how your fellow citizens of the Bear Republic disport themselves in the city of Los Angeles, in the great city of Los Angeles. Well, are we ready to start at this time? Uh, sh uh, okay, are you starting your streaming now? or The streaming has already started. The streaming okay. has started. The meeting is uh, about to start in uh, three seconds, two, one, mark. Welcome to the January SV Fig meeting and Happy New Year to many of those of you who are out there on the interwebs and here today with us in Corpus. Uh, and now a man who needs an introduction, exactly. uh, Jack Ware, uh, and his talk about uh, quantum computing. Take it away, Jack. And I'm going to turn off my mic. Okay, so this is my cheap approximation of insight into UCSB quantum computing. Um, some years ago, UCSB started, you know, a, 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 a group was formed, the Martinez Group, around Dr. John Martinez, and they began, you know, what the heck, let's build a quantum computer. And then Google bought them recently. Remember last year, the, f the flavor of the day was D-Wave. Um, right now, this is the flavor of the day this year. Everything we knew is wrong. But it's not true that everything we knew is wrong. It's very interesting what happened. And I, I actually got to talk to Dr. Martinez again. I talked to him in 2009 for Dr. Dobbs' journal online. And there's a link to that somewhere in here in the course of this slide presentation. You will see that. And um, Dr. Martinez, I, I, I'll just tell you what the one capsular thing about him. And that is that he is, I think... He is certainly the finest engineer that I have encountered. In he is just he's he's a real engineer that I've encountered in my quantum computing. I've met brilliant. I've talked to brilliant theoreticians. I've talked to Nobel Prize winners. Dr. John Martinez is the best engineer I have talked to in the quantum computing field. And we are going to get to a discussion with him. And I, I'm going to show you the discussion and sort of read it to you like a bedtime story. And I'm going to make some comments that some inferences I make from what I was told. Uh, 
a little later in the presentation. But let's see what we're doing here. Okay, the next thing is I had to show you this. I think this is important. You know, Richard M. Stallman the other day said, Facebook isn't your friend. Facebook is a surveillance engine. So I'm on Facebook all the time. So this is, this is but I, I hate it, but I'm on it all day. So um, refereed papers cost money. Since I'm too cheap to pay for articles from Nature and Physics today, this is my approximation of insight into the work of the Martinez Group, and it's derived from a brief conversation from Dr. Martinez on December 4th of last year, and from inferences made on the basis of the pretty pictures up on the Martinez Group website. The pretty pictures here are from the Martinez Group website. I have no rights whatsoever to distribute them, but they're up on the web, so I think they probably wouldn't care if I show a few of them in the course of this presentation. Um, and this is the Martinez Group original website at UCSB. Like I said, they are now a wholly, they're employees of Google. And it's, it's kind of funny, but, you know, one Google Uber Alice. Um, this is what they're building. Look at this. My God, isn't this beautiful? Look at this thing. This is a quantum computing chip. It has four qubits in it. You can see them. There are eight control lines and four qubits. The, re the engineering invention, you know, the qubit thing, everybody's got a qubit. And we'll talk about this a little later. Everybody's got a qubit. You can make qubits. I mean, qubits can be bought on street corners now. But there are engineering problems about making a computer using qubits. And this is what Martinez seems to be as, as, as far as this particular, your, your idiot commentator here can tell. He seems to really be tuned into that aspect of it. This is the mechanical resonator that made the chip you saw before possible. This is, this is a few years. This picture was taken a few years before the other picture I just showed you. This was part of an earlier. This is like, you know, I, you, you, can, you can find out on the website when this was. It was either 2008, 2009, or 2011 or something. You've got qubits. In super, you got qubits in relation. Go back. Let's go back to the other image. You got qubits in relation, but suddenly you don't want them connected to each other. How do you do that? How you know you, you get, all of us are familiar with the basic rules of quantum physics. I think like like all of us are familiar with Isaac Asimov's three laws of robotics. In other words, it's we know about, it's as, about as real to us, quantum physics is about as real to us as Isaac Asimov's robots. But we do know what they are, and that is like that in sum, when quantum entities are in a coherent state with one another, when they are when they are spookily entangled, nothing must interfere. Nothing must disturb this or the computation is done. It is latched into a state. It was in a superposition of states, but now the real world has called to it. Or not exactly the real world because the quantum world is our real world, but the, the, the weird inexplicable paradoxes of quantum physics take place here and whatever they are, you can't, how do you do switching in a computer? How do you do switching? That's basically the problem. And this is what, this was the solution. They came up with this, this, this mechanical resonator which approximates being itself one quantum entity. The switch itself is a one single quantum entity. And so it can be played with without disturbing the entanglement of the entities which it is switching between and this was what made this possible and here is their description of it from their website the res architecture uses resonators with qubits in the zero state to turn off stray coupling each qubit is coupled to a memory resonator and coupling between the qubits is mediated by a common resonator bus Eight microwave lines drive the individual qubits, memory resonators, and coupling resonators. These are the eight qubit microwave lines. 
We demonstrate control over the quantum microprocessor via small-scale quantum algorithms that require executing high-fidelity single qubit gates, quantum Fourier transform to Foley C, not another entangling gates. Okay, let me translate the last sentence. What they're saying is what the level of experimentation they're at now is that they are, the, the level of development of this, they're inventing this technology out of theories and a couple demonstrations that the basic principles are sound, coupled with a lot of engineering knowledge and coupled with the knowledge of Silicon Valley and the world's foundrying abilities so they can design things that can be foundried for them. They're used that Martinez, Martinez, one of Martinez's biggest sales uh, value points in his Martinez group presentation, I would say, is that he's using extant technology to build these things. He's trying to deal with, he's inventing new technology, but he can, he can build his parts with what exists and they don't have to build new processes to build his ideas. They've got the processes that can build his ideas or very close to it anyway. And um, so what he's saying, what this thing is saying, this is kind of, this is a little bit sales speak. And what they're saying is the, the point at which they are at in their experimentation is they're prepared now by and large, to distribute, to to to, to, to demonstrate the execution of small-scale quantum algorithms, and their sales point here is that the algorithms are that they use are requiring high fidelity single qubit gates, and their emphasis is on high fidelity. This is what Martinez has been trying to achieve. I he didn't put it this way, but I think his philosophy is. If we can't flip a qubit and know that it's flipped reliably, how is this ever going to work? And so it's all about making it actually work. What a wonderful approach. It's not about demonstrating that the principle is correct and statistically 97 times out of 112 you get the result you expect and that would be actually a very high number for early quantum computing experimentation. But um, can we make this real? Are we ever going to build real machines? Are we ever going to build real machines that can be used in the business and science world and government world? Are they ever going to exist? And if they are, little things like tiny little switches that can live in the entangled world are part of it, and that's where these guys seem to excel. Him and his team seem to excel. Okay, and I want you to remember our old friend, the quantum amplifier from previous previous presentations and previous years. Of course, you know, uh, what's it, John Keats. This is uh, his Ode to a Grecian Urn, which was, he actually was being a little sarcastic and humorous, but it is a nice line. Beauty is truth and truth is beauty. We say in engineering, you know, form is function. And I, I want you to look at the old quantum, this is NASA's quantum amplifier, form is function, the little sparkles are not artifices of the photographic process. They're actually notches in the wire intended to break harmonics of wavelengths. Uh, this is an illusion of the, 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 the um, little arrows are an illusion of the photographic process, but the little yellow dots here are actually, you know, tiny wavelength notches to break up undesirable harmonics. Form is function. Look at this. Look at this chip again. Isn't this amazing? Isn't it? You're looking at you're looking at form being function in quantum computing, in a way that in a in, in a way that is artistically beautiful, to the degree that I've not yet that I had not previously seen it. I think this is the most beautiful anthropological human artifact of the early um, QM era. This this and and the quantum amplifier are the two most beautiful anthropological artifacts of our science here in the 21st century uh, in terms of in, in the field of quantum computing. Conversation with Dr. John Martinez, Martinez Group, UCSB, Google. Uh, permission is granted for anybody to make any legal use of this. I just had a wonderful talk with this man who took time from doing real things to talk to an idiot like me. For the second time, after knowing that I was an idiot, he talked to me the second time. 
So what has changed since 2009? They spent a lot of effort on materials and understanding how to build the devices. Other groups have made advances, but they've been, in addition to having longer coherence time, they've been able to make circuits that put many qubits together so they function as a processor. This was the problem with the ion trap computers. If you remember the guys who were actually pushing what beryllium ions up and down magnetic channels and they'd bump them into each other and they'd become coherent and stuff like that. But how do you do algorithms like that? You have to shunt them aside. You end up, bu you end up building railroad tracks for the actual physical ions to slide up these magnetic channels and stuff like that. It wasn't really like much of a way. It was like doing computing with those little balls where you pull the one on the end of the seven balls and you swing it and they all swing as a pendulum and you know it was kind of like that kind of thing it wasn't that use it was there was no there was no obvious direction to make it a physical computer so they've been they have been able as we saw to put many qubits together i.e. four on the chip and they're doing real things with it and they are working together properly with high fidelity at the same time, that's been the big result in the past year or so, where we really figured how to put everything together and get it to work well. Hallelujah. So D-Wave, we talked about D-Wave last year. Like I said, it was kind of like those games where you tip the, tip the tray and the little balls ran downhill in the little maze, that, that its algorithms worked like that. And not only that, but even after we talked, even after um, both I and uh, you know Time Magazine made comments on their work and on how impressive it was within the very, very stringent limits of what they were trying to achieve, um, it still remained controversial even in the past 12 months since I have spoken to you, ladies and gentlemen, um, that... Um, whether it really worked. And I think the conversation got confused between, as far as I understood that literature, it became confused between the question of whether it worked as the mathematical theorists of quantum computing hoped it would, it would work, and whether it actually speeded up the process of computing whatever it was being used to compute. And I think, I think, as far as I can tell, the general consensus is, yes, it demonstrated quantum computing, and it was so complicated, and the error checking was so laborious and, uh, computationally that it didn't, <laughs> that even though there was real quantum computing going on, it didn't actually speed anything up. But it, it proved that this stuff, it, it sort of helped prove, it lent credence to the belief that quantum computing actually works, which really, even in this day, isn't 100% the consensus of the community, but it is the overwhelming consensus that it does work at this point, and D-Wave is definitely part of that. Uh, and Dr. Martinez uh, goes and elucidates to some extent the difference between the kind of processor. Um, and I'm reading between the lines here. He's, I think what he means when he's saying this is a different kind of processor, as he says, is he saying we're better engineers? And when he says the coherence of a processor is extremely important to its operation, he's saying we're making devices that work a lot better than what they built. And he says we've been working on the quantum state, not losing its memory during the operation of a quantum algorithm. Is we've got immensely better coherence than D-Wave. I think that's what he's really saying. Whether it's true or not, you know, that's the papers and the measurements. I have no access at all, so I don't know. We're talking. Is this an approach to the same kind of quantum computing D-Wave was engaged in, or is this headed towards ops-based quantum computing? Remember last time we talked, and we talked about D-Wave, we talked about they were basically doing, you know, algorithms that worked one way, a certain way. There was like kind of, you know, I, I, made a, I made a parallel. I said it was sort of like the analog computing, but the dream, the holy grail for quantum computing enthusiasts is ops-based computing where you got a processor and you execute operations. The operations are like assembly code and they make up, you know, a computing program that does a quantum computation. And I said, so what you're doing with D-Wave was doing, which I, had, I think I had made the analogy last year that it was uh, like analog computing versus digital binary computing. 
And and Dr. Martinez responds by making the same analogy. He says, I like to talk about it in a very general way and call it analog quantum computing and digital quantum computing. Analog quantum computing is kind of what D-Wave has been doing, directly encode a problem into some analog quantum processor. In other words, they were in the, you know, you program it with a screwdriver stage, kind of like the University of Chicago in the 1930s was with computing. Our research results at the USCSB in the past couple of years is more like digital quantum computing. We're trying to make individual qubits with very good coherence where you build error correction on top of that and then tr and then try to run some digital quantum algorithm, which is the op space. In other words, so he's heading into the op based era and this is what he's shooting for. Just like digital computation came after analog computation, you can imagine that happening in the quantum world too. The kind of analog processor that D-Wave is building can be made in some sense a little simpler than the digital one because the digital processor requires you have all this overhead about doing quantum error correction. That's fundamental physics and you have to be able to do that. That you have to be able to do that. Oh well, that's kind of an aside. So you're making progress towards this ideal opcode based quantum computing. Right. Okay, good. And the machine you're actually building, the layers of quantum correction or something, would still have to be designed and built once you have reliable hardware. That's right. Now, to complicate this story a bit, he tells me, not too much. What we've been doing for the past few years at UC Santa Barbara, then this summer we announced that I and my group are now working with Google. I'm a Google employee, and much of my team is. What we're doing is we're also looking at the annealer in these analog applications too. I remember I said that the, the, these algorithms were, I believe I used the term quantum annealing last year when we were talking about um, D-Wave. What he means is they're looking at the analog approach at the same, I read between the lines again and excuse me and I'm, I'm, I'm mostly being funny but it sounds like corporate foo. It sounds like the deal was they came in and they're going to pursue their projects, but they also promised to make some people happy who have a lot of skin in the game in the Google executive layer is happy by looking at D-Wave and trying to salvage something from that that they can use in their own technology or something, kind of like when a company is busy acquiring all kinds of things all at the same time and then they put someone in charge of making it all one harmonious whole. And what it usually is is more like a money hole. But anyway, but any so 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 he says we're looking at the annealer in these analog applications too. We're kind we've kind of broadened the scope of what we're doing, trying to build both analog processors and digital processors. Ho ho ho, we're all programmers. We know when you take someone in and a division in that's good at doing one thing and saying, by the way, in addition to this, you are going to assimilate all the work that another division that was run on a totally different philosophy was doing. Good luck with that, doctor. I salute you. We're taking the technology to develop some coherence in qubits and put them together using special materials and processes and the like and apply that to an annealer kind of system. So, I mean, again, I'm being funny, but, you know, in the corporate world, I can imagine this being a situation where they'll build a secondary thing and it will be quietly disposed of and no one will ever hear of it again. But maybe I'm just being too cynical. Maybe I've been reading Dilbert too long. So, um... Coherence times in the 20 to 30 microsecond range and operation times 10 to the 20... Did I, did I show that? I guess I must have seen, shown those numbers. He said that at this point. At this point, we've run experiments... Oops. At this point, we've run experiments up to 9 qubits. We have coherence times in the 20 to 30 microsecond range. Our gate times, the time it takes to do operation is about 10 to 20 nanoseconds. Okay. So now we're up here. And uh, we're still in the stage where we have to complete our algorithm to observe the results because we don't have quantum RAM, I'm saying to him. So we cannot store intermediate results in the coherent state and import those results back in from memory for the next step of a quantum computation. And Dr. Martinez says, that's why the digital quantum computing we're trying to do, the error correction. Using error correction, we extend the lifetime of our qubits. It's like classical computing. If you have noisy bits, you store a bit, three or five or more bits, and then use some voting mechanism. We can do the same for quantum computing. If there are any physical errors, you can correct for that and still get a logical qubit that has better performance than individual qubits. And this doesn't violate the observation rule. Dun, 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 dun. 
mysteries of quantum physics. That's correct. You put it together in a way where you don't observe a particular qubit, but you kind of observe either two qubits or four qubits in a special way so that you don't destroy the information you're trying to preserve. And I infer that what he's saying is that you... Um, you put a voting network together and they will assume the state that the majority vote holds. You're not really observing it, you're just letting them all interact at the in, in the magic quantum world. The whole idea of quantum error correction has been around for a few years and when he says quantum error correction, I think um, it means something a little different than, than, than we think in computing. It has a little bit more baggage because um, what keeps a bit in a digital binary computer sane is that it has roughly you know, in a, in, in, in a very, very broad neighborhood, the right number of electrons on the right side of the fence. And they leak, and they leak constantly, but if you zap them, you know, we know how DRAM and stuff is refreshed. Quantum error correction is kind of like DRAM refresh in the quantum world. Because it's ongoing... without things leaving the quantum state. So I've just asked him in the previous slide about the idea of quantum DRAM, where you could... The problem with quantum computing, of course, as we've discussed before, uh, you, you have to complete a computation or you have to find a way to store the intermediate results without observation. And so... Um, so basically, the, the processor itself is its own... D, the registers of the processor itself are its own DRAM, I think is kind of... If we want to pull further the analogy uh, from the era of the development of analog and quantum computing. Um, quantum uh, error correction is kind of an intermediate state where, there, where, where all information is stored in registers and there just is no DRAM. Uh, but you can still do a lot more than you can do with the analog style computing if that is the case. Have you, so, so, I, so, I, so I pursue perseverate, you might say, on the subject of of DRAM. I'm hoping that, you know, as I'm asking the question, I am hoping that Dr. Martinez gives me a glimmer of how that's going to go, too, in, in, in the coming beautiful world of ops-based, uh, store the result-based, full von, von Neumann-like quantum computers. I said, have you experimented at all with light traps and electron gas traps? that would allow you to store quantum inter intermediate products in the quantum state. You may have, I should have put in a picture of the light trap. I don't know if you've heard this, but I mean, probably everybody's heard this, but they, they, can, they can shoot some light into a crystal and before the light emerges the other end, they can change the polarity of the crystal and the crystal becomes, instead of translucent, it becomes opaque. But if they reverse the polarity again and let the light, and and make it translucent again. The light the light was frozen inside, and it proceeds in the same state of entanglement it was in um, previously, and proceeds out of the crystal at the other end. So you know, light traps either obvious try for DRAM or SRAM or something like that in the quantum world. Something analogous to DRAM or SRAM in the quantum world. It would maybe light traps. So I said, have you experimented with light traps and gas traps that would allow you to make quantum DRAM? And he says, our system is based on storing this information in the superconducting wires and circuits and devices. In other words, it's in process in the algorithm, in the processor, and there's no other place to store it. It's just, you know, and, and quantum error correction extends the life until the quantum, uh, you know, computation is done and you can fetch the final result into the, you know, quotidian world. Um, as you start trans... So, so, but but the, the point is what he says as I have pursued this idea of quantum DRAM, he makes this wonderful, wonderful engineering answer. God bless him. He says, as soon as you start transferring information from one physical system to another, things get complicated. 
That's how primitive, you know, the quantum computing thing is. Okay, we've managed to build a few qubit processor. It has four qubits on it. We've gone up to nine qubits in interaction. And you want me to hook a memory bus onto this? You know, the guy's a great engineer. So we've been sticking with storing it in these electrical states because we can do that. And while we can do that, we are going to learn more. And then maybe someday what you dream of, someone will do and we will have a real computer. But... So the whole computation must be complete for the observation within the 20 and to 30 microsecond coherence range you described. And he says, using error correction, you can extend the lifetime of a state longer and longer as you make your system more complex. There are proposals out there that theoretically you should be able to, uh, to extend the lifetime of your quantum state by a factor of 10 to the 15, any, almost any amount you want. Theoretically, you should be able to hold a quantum state for the lifetime of the universe if you so desire, if you had room for it. Because, of course, you know, you have so many bits in the quantum process, you're going to have to have memory someday. But this works now, and with quantum error correction, they could extend the life of the quantum state, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so he has the potential here, if he can totally debug these chips, to make a tremendous amount of validation of the general approach of quantum computing because you will have a really, really clean, clean slate that you can blank out over and over again and reliably execute quantum algorithms if they work. It will not be a question as, is the processor broken or do they not work? He's trying to build reliable enough hardware that you say, yes, the processor works. If the algorithm doesn't work, the algorithm is broken and our understanding of this is broken and performing a great service thereby. In practice, we've been able to significantly extend, oops, whoops, significantly extend it beyond the 30 microsecond limit by good factor, we have a paper coming out, which I will probably never read. So, so you see on the horizon enough coherence time to carry out any quantum computation, quantum computation you would currently want to make. Yes, we just have to extend lifetime more and more by putting in more qubits for error correction, etc. Which is what you'd expect theoretically. We have to show it experimentally. And then he goes on to describe as I have described where he's going and where this whole process is going, which is two ops-based quantum computing. After that, you have to be able to do logical operations like AND and NOT gates of a classical computer. Uh, you know, C NOT is one of the favorite ones. Control NOT is apparently the universal gate like NAND that you can build any quantum op from C NOT. Is quantum computing pushing our understanding of quantum mechanics? And Again, the answer is engineering. He, he looks over the horizon of his cubicle to the absolute theory, but it's reassuring that all the evidence has been that our standard understanding of quantum mechanics is correct. But we still have to keep testing where everything is working properly, especially as we build more and more coherent systems. And when he means working properly, properly he means do the theories still work? As they, you know, one of the great stories of theoretical physics, of course, is that um, um, Edison's answer to the theoreticians of England, the great electrical theoreticians of England, who had decided that everyone knew the incandescent bulb was coming. When it came, it was going to be a high amperage device, they said. Their calculations showed that, and Edison said it's going to be a low amperage device. And um, the theoretic theoretical phys um, um, physicists of um, England replied, how do you conclude that? And he said, because that's easier and that's what I can afford to build in terms of power transmission networks, therefore it's going to be a low amperage device. And they told him he was wrong by the laws of physics and he was right. So he's focusing really on uh, he's not really concerned about the abstract laws of quantum physics. That's probably the last thing he's thinking of. You know, I, I asked this you know terribly deep question, and the answer is that's not the question. The question is, it looks like the bait that our standard our standard of quantum mechanics is correct. We still have to keep testing. The question for him is where, whether everything will still. It, it's you know he doesn't know if everything will still work properly when they push the boundary a little farther. He, there might be some surprises. But basically, he's hoping that his devices work. 
I go on and persist in the question, sort of, you know, the, th the idea about the basic ideas of quantum physics. You're bound to see matter at a level of detail that goes beyond the standard mechanical model. And he says, there might be other sources of error you might not have thought about in your simplistic views of how the atom works and how things can go wrong with the quantum state. So you look at very carefully at the data you have to see if there are new pieces of physics coming into your problem you haven't anticipated. He's saying, every time you think you've discovered a bust to the laws of physics as they are understood by the quantum mechanics, uh, you, it's probably an error in your equipment, and you have to go and find that. You know, There's correlated error. This is interesting. The question is whether correlated error exists, but there's a theory that correlated error exists like we used to have in fourth. We used to have the equal and opposite complementary stack errors where your program would run and the stack wouldn't crash, but one, one entity was underflowing the stack and one entity was overflowing the stack, so it balanced out within a certain framework, and, and, and it would work, and you'd get all the wrong answers. He says that apparently there's something like that correlated error in um, on qubits, uh, you have an error on one qubit, and it, I guess an entangled error on a neighboring qubit pops up. You know, it's correlated. So they they can make so so the problem with correlated errors is they make things look like they're working well, but they but they uh, you get the wrong answers. I said, have you proven the existence of correlated error? So. Are you playing with having a machine ready for sale? For sale, he says we're still working on the basic science. Working with Google is very interesting, says Dr. Matias, because we're interested in solving real computer science problems associated with machine learning. We don't want to necessarily sell one; we want to build one that's useful for Google. Making something useful is a bit far off. We're still on the basic science, says the on engineer with the honesty of an engineer and not a marketeer. This is going to be still a long struggle. Was the Martinez group moved to Google aside? Google was ready to move on from the D-Wave approach. Or is that too much to read into it? They're still using the D-Wave machine and doing experiments on it. We're trying to do this in a complementary way to D-Wave. The way D-Wave makes the chips use is a certain way of building chips. We're going to use other physical concepts I think are complementary. Uh, I read better into the word complementary. It's going to it's going to complement them so much they're going to go away and leave him alone. I think it is. We're not trying to compete with D-Wave. Instead, do something complementary because cooperation in a mega corporation is important. But um, I agree that Dr. Martinez is on the inside track. I don't know how far he's going to get. Um, but he's knows how you get there. This is like exploring the South Pole. He's explored, and he's a pretty good explorer of technological space and a solver of problems and a trimmer of... And a trimmer of pruner of search trees and a terminator of meetings and um, this is you know it was it was wonderful to talk to him and wonderful to see what he's accomplished and I think he's it's clear in how long he's worked on this I you know I've, I've known the Martinez group was there for some time it's clear how far he's gotten in the time he's worked on this with re really actually a small team, which can be an advantage. It's clear that um, this is the fastest progress has been seen, I think, in quantum computing. The amount of turf he has crossed since, like, 2009. This is quite impressive. So uh, he definitely is, you know... Cheers to the Martinez group at UCSB. They are clearly the, the flavor of the year in quantum computing, and it was a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to them. And that's about all I have to say. Well, thank you, Jax. Uh, I guess we'll open well, it up to questions, if you can hear me. Can you hear me now? I, I can hear you now. All right, then. 
I guess with our incredible level of organization, we have not actually organized this concept of taking questions from the audience. It looks like John is going to come up to the front of the room, sit where I'm sitting now, and take the mic and ask some silly ass question. Put that to your shirt, otherwise it will sound like crap. Not that end. Yes. Hello there. Can you hear me? I hear you just fine. Okay. Uh, you mentioned something about uh, quantum RAM. Uh, and you also uh, brought up a thing of correlated error. Now, uh, from my uh, uh, study of quantum mechanics, uh, would there be uh, some uh, correlated errors in RAM, especially if you have uh, uh, qubits in close proximity to one another? Well, the potential certainly exists for that. I remember staying until midnight debugging a board in the 1980s because uh, I was I had written the operating system in fourth. Somebody else had built the board, and I was up till midnight figuring it out. And uh, every time I my program kept moving memory to the wrong place, and of course the lines were cross talking. So anything you know, engineering is engineering, and that was what was so beautiful about talking to Dr. Martinez because. Every time I asked questions along those lines, he his response was essentially the same. It was, um, we'll see, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. The potential for error also always exists. The problem is making higher fidelity and higher fidelity circuits. We're busy at work. We'll see how far we can get. And so that's, I think that's the answer. Yes, if they ever build quantum memory, the possibility for error will be immensely great because you're talking about memory that is, instead of being stored like early RAM was in several, several, you know, early RAM, very billions of electrons made up a single bit, uh, this is going to be the, the spin of an individual, uh, basically, I, I, it's virtual particles. These are, this is beyond, you know, entry-level QM, you know, virtual particles in the microwave environment. You certainly have heard of that phenomenon. Yeah. So this is, uh, you know, the the possibility for error means, you know, can a single X-ray or, can, you know, can a single stray gamma ray, you know, come within, you know, a, a, a micron of the working part of the chip. So, of course, the error, as you point out, the potential for error is immensely greater. So they'll just have to build this. Maybe they'll be building this in the 2020s, building DRAM for quantum computers, or maybe somebody's building it now. Who knows? Well, what I, one of the things that you brought up, you know, a stray uh, photon coming in, yeah. uh, what could happen is it, it could cause a, uh, a qubit to flip, and then now you, if you have two other or one other qubit that's in the same state, now those guys, their superposition now can take over, where now you can have any other stray bits, I mean, uh, not stray bits, but qubits, will then have a possibility of flipping to that uh, state of the two uh, qubits that were uh, uh, flipped. And in essence, you could have a, uh, like a whole word all of a sudden turning into one, one same state. I mean, right, well, that, that there is, but of course, what Dr. Martinez was talking about was how you wire error correction to these chips and how you make it so any reaction like that causes not the reaction that you describe, but causes the correction of the error. And of course, that's you know, the cleverness of people who design the circuits that are the basis of basic computation. And, the, and his question is, can we design such circuits accurately? And, you know, so you, that's exactly the question the good doctor is trying to answer right now with his team and the, and the millions and billions of dollars of Google. Yes. Yes, that's, that's what I'm saying, because I remember a problem when I was in graduate school <clears throat> with uh, having uh, small magnets in a row, you know, where their you know, poles are end to end. And if the temperature is hot enough, then they're obviously, you know, switching state, but as the temperature drops, that agitation, you know, you could get some uh, <clears throat> of these uh, magnets that will go into a lower uh, uh, state where you have one that's, you know, where you have the north 
uh, n is uh, lined up with the south end of, its, of an adjacent magnet, then that magnetization becomes strong enough to cause neighboring magnets to flip into a lower state. That's what, that's the kind of concept I'm talking about. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. There's, but, uh, there's a... Um, there is an appearance of... The discreteness of... Uh, I probably shouldn't be venturing into this, but there's there's a appearance in... QM of discreteness of such transitions. Um, no, I'm not gonna go there. I'm not gonna go there. You're, we're, we're beyond where I we're beyond what I know. So let's. So I, I will have to defer to the, what you told me without making any further comment. Oh, okay. All right. And now, by the way, has uh, any work been done uh, uh, being able to uh, port a computer language to a quantum computer? Yes, yes. Imagine, uh, hypothetically, you see, the gates you would require, which I brushed past very quickly in one of the slides that I showed, uh, the gates, uh, there, there are all kinds of gates that people have hypothetically created that would allow quantum computing. You, you know, if there, was, if there were ever a quantum computer, they said, starting back in the 1990s, if there were ever a quantum computer, and if it were ever kind of like a digital binary computer where it had operations and you operated on data that stored them, if it was kind of like a von Neumann machine where, you know, memory fed, you know, the program's in memory, the program is fetched, uh, the data is fetched, you know, if this all worked like that, if there was an assembly language for quantum computing, what would it look like? And they came up with a, with a bunch of gates. And if you look like, if you look quantum computing opcodes, if you do a Google search, you will find pages of enthusiasts, graduate students who have written, uh, who, who worked out what are generally accepted at this point. There's actually some kind of body that, that votes on these things at this point, kind of standardizing a hypothetical quantum computing language that cannot yet be implemented. They're working on it. Uh -oh. And uh, they are going beyond assembly code and they're writing high-level languages that would be used for quantum computing and it's causing them, these graduate students in their uh, you know, competitive intelligence to go, forge ahead and come up with new quantum algorithms and find ways to execute them on imaginary process. There are emulators you can buy. A, you buy. You can download quantum emulators. There's a limit to how far they can go. They can only do the simplest stuff because the execution time. The point about quantum computing is that. One of the reasons it's being sought is because execution time is great, so the emulators don't do very well at competing with quantum computing. They're billions of times slower. So you can only do certain things, but they do have emulators that will operate. You can write little quantum programs, and they will be executed. On a, you can tell how many qubits you want to execute on, and if you choose too many, you can go away, and your computer will never operate again. But um, the... Uh, the, it, yes is the answer to your question. Yes, oh, people okay. are thinking about this very, very hard, low, both low-level and high-level languages, and, and getting ready for the day when someone says, your hardware is ready, sir, or ma'am. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh, maybe I ought to start looking into doing quantum fourth. <laughs> it, it, it's, it, it's an obvious uh, metaphor because... Uh, I mean, there's you know, fetch and store operations have to exist, which don't exist at the moment. Right. There has to be some way to fetch and some way to store. And the, you got to look at how quantum algorithms work before you make any pronouncements. But there are some. There are certain are less certain. There certainly are lessons. If the question is, are there lessons from fourth that could be brought forward into quantum computing? Yes, I mean, obviously. The, the 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 prime directive law one of 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 the of the Chuck Moore law of robotics, which is that simpler is better. Exactly. Start simple and build something fancy after you got the basic science worked out, which is exactly the approach Dr. Martinez is taking. Right. Yeah. Well, it would sound like you'd have to uh, port the uh, uh, nucleus, the fourth nucleus, into uh, the quantum world. Well, that's an interesting question, but, you know, most people kind of see quantum computers as being cards dropped into conventional computers, and the conventional computer 
is the communication device that there's no impetus to make uh, quantum computers that know how to use the PCI bus. You know, that that's, that that's a waste of time. Instead, there should be a quantum computer on a PCI card, and it drops into your computer, and you, um, um, you know, someday in some imaginary world, you got to remember that these things operate at close to zero Kelvin. Oh, yes. And so yes. it's not, but on the other hand, that sort of stuff has become consumer technology. I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but you actually can get things down to close to absolute zero in your home, buying equipment that you can get on the net from people who sell scientific equipment. You could have a helium bottle. You could do this. You could do that. You could get down fairly close, you know, fairly close to absolute zero with this stuff. So, so the question of Remember what happened? It's like you know, I've I've, I've got an IBM fifty one ten. I'm looking at it right now. When I turn my head, I'm looking at this IBM fifty one ten in a plastic bag. I'm going to give it to a computer club in Chicago. Uh, it's a nineteen seventy five APL computer. The processor is about the size of a chessboard of a wood, wooden chessboard, and it's hand wired. And it's had their transistors on it and they're hand wired and it's got a, a fourth like sixteen by sixty four screen and it does APL, which is a very fourth like language, at least in yes. its requirements. I which, do remember APL. <laughs> so uh, uh, you know right after that, suddenly the that was about the bridge at which the hobby computing era started, and all of a sudden people had four bit and eight bit processors and were building their own computers. So when does this, uh, you know, to, to reverse a modern metaphor, when, when does quantum computing jump the shark? You know, when does it go over the, when, when does it go over the wall and become consumer technology? Like, you know, there's consumer technology DNA kits now, you know, for making recombinant DNA. So uh, when does quantum computing jump the fence and, and and get out of the lab and suddenly there's a thousand enthusiasts in the North North America and then there's ten thousand enthusiasts and all of a sudden people are saying, I want to solve the game of chess you know, and they're building a computer that's going to solve the game of chess. And you know, there's uh, there's arguments that there are foreseeable algorithms for actually solving the game of chess in the quantum world, you know. So um, answering questions like what's the best first move? <laughs> There may be no answer to that question. They, they may all come out even. I think they'll all come out even. But um, the, uh, I think that when that starts to happen is when this is all going to happen. Oh, cool, cool. I'll I mean, when, when, you, when you can go build one at home, you know, when you can go try to build one and you can guess you can make a computer sophisticated enough that it helps that, it, that with a proper computer algorithm added to it, it allows you to... You know, bust 128-bit DES because that's the first step. That's the first. That's the first algorithm everybody wants. That's the first thing. That's the first mission quantum computers have: bust 128-bit DES so it takes us takes a microsecond to open a message. Well, then we would have a truly open society. We well, are, you're right. Well, you know, so. you know, privacy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Here's. Do we Kevin. have some now? <laughs> reminds me of this big Thank you, huge John. Thank you, John. Yeah. Reminds me of this big huge computer center that they built for the NSA, you know, the out of the Bond movie with the helipad and the elevator to drop the helicopter down into the building and so forth. I have a question about your research. Uh, you had mentioned uh, not being able to read refereed papers. Uh, in my youth, when I felt the need to read refereed papers, I would go to some library of some institution of higher learning and uh, care for the easily amused. Uh, is there such a place near you? Oh, yeah. This is, uh, uh, Colorado University. I probably should get off my butt and go there. Uh, this year, this holiday has been a very busy time, and I probably would have done a better job, and I apologize. But um, the I, I really would like to uh, get a little deeper into this stuff. So I think I'm going to wander up to, to Colorado University sometime in 2015 and sit down in the Graduate Library or something like that. The, you know, the Gamow building is there. Remember George Gamow? So they've got this old kind of Art Deco building that was designed for the physics department. Uh, 
looks kind of like a spaceship taking off. Um, but th this holiday season was very busy for family reasons. My dad's very old, and he's uh, not well. And so things are getting kind of – things are starting to get – have been getting a little exciting over the past few weeks. Yeah, so. I know how that is. So. Uh, but uh, there exists a possibility that there might be a market – uh, in the popular press for the sort of information that you conveyed here today, uh, perhaps with a little bit more polish on it. And uh, I know you've written such things. Uh, you know, the, the popular science uh, sort of uh, venue. So I, I recommend that to you. And uh, if uh, there aren't any other questions uh, or nasty comments. Uh, it looks not. Uh, I would say that perhaps uh, we'll, we'll ask you now to, uh, to come back uh, in December uh, or January of uh, December of this year or January of next year and regale us again with the, uh, the quantum computing year in review. Certainly, thank you very much. And if you hear of anybody who does want, you know, articles about this, I certainly could write a more polished article, uh, you know, given a certain amount of time and effort and money. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I bet you you could pitch it to Popular Science or or Popular something or other. I don't or know. Unpopular, this is unpopular science. I tried that. That happened to DDJ. You know, the editor uh, just said. My readers aren't interested in this. Either. The Journal of Irreproducible Results comes the to journal. mind. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, thank you, folks. Nice seeing you all again. Happy New Year. Yeah. The, the guy who could hang up the phone on you is, uh, is now gone. So what we're going to do is say uh, uh, that we're going to lunch, and we'll be back at some time in the future. And uh, I'll see you soon. I've got to close my browser. Yeah. I'm going to turn off my uh, microphone, and uh, we're going to hang up the phone uh, on the interwebs. So uh, those of you who are watching, maybe send us an email and let us know what you thought. Uh, we're curious to know if there's anybody out there. Uh, thank you, and goodbye.